I'm Glenn Garvin, Chief Servant Officer at Life Center Church, and it's great to have you with me. We are going through a friendship series. Now, we're going through a friendship series for a very specific reason. It's in this whole area of how to make disciples. Really, it's being a disciple, but also making. And that would be talking about making disciples within the church and then also outside the church, making disciples outside of and with connecting with unbelievers. But let's just dive in. So making friends is it's, it's, it's like a dance. Uh, and a discovery all at the same time. And we're looking through, we're going through Proverbs as the main focus. I just want to let you know, Proverbs normally, it sets a lot of the wisdom scenes in more of a warning or a negative context. And we're going to use that and also talk about the, the positive aspects of those particular verses. But before we get all started today, I, I just have a confession and apology to make. Last last week in the series, I exclusively used a Bible translation in the message, and uh, and I discovered it's not good. The, the the Bible that I had used, the version I've used, it's not good for personal study, and memorization, or meditation. So it is definitely not good to use to speak or to teach from. I just want to let you know I used the Passion translation, but it's not a translation at all. I wrote about it in my notes. I'll post those uh, link to those notes. Uh, and you'll look at it all the way to the bottom of the notes. I have a, an entire section that talks about why this is not a good version uh, for, uh, for the Bible. And so I believe there are very good reasons to not use this version. This, this version is one man's idea of interpreting the Word of God. Uh, for now, just please accept my apology uh, for not finding about it sooner. So back to the art of friendship. It's just that. It's an art. Making friends is an expression of effort not an evaluation of stock performance, right? It's more an art than a calculated system. Thus, it's a bit more intuitive in the, in the right brain versus the methodological in the left brain. But just because it's initially might take more of right brain functions, what are those? Well, that's like freewheeling, creativity, intuition, emotional response, and imagination. Those usually take place in the right brain. But it doesn't mean the left brain is not also extremely helpful with more logical or bookish functions. You know, our ability to do things like communicate, strategize, solve problems, memorize, and analyze, those all come from the left brain. So taking both of those together, because that's exactly how our brain kind of works, like how do we make friends? Let's talk about it. And how do we let the Holy Spirit help us in doing so? In Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, written as a self-help book in 1936, <laughs> way back there, I would say, I would say, man, my, this, is, this is before I was born for sure. It's before my parents were born. So, But it has sold over 30 million copies worldwide, making it one of the best-selling books of all times. Now, one of Dale's great quotes about making friends, it's, it helps us remember how it works. A person's favorite sound is their own name and their favorite topic is themselves. Think about that for a second as we go into this idea of making friends. Oftentimes, making friends reminds me of my first junior high dance. My mom made me attend my uh, junior high dance because she, uh, she apparently she had a wonderful time at her own school dances and she wanted me to be more social. I don't know if you've had moms do this. My mom did. Uh, so nothing screams panic more than a socially awkward kid at a junior high dance. Ah, that's me. Uh, they had some old recordings of the dances back in that day. So I want to show you how I tried to dance in junior high. Let's watch this real quick. Dancing. Come on, who's dancing? You want me to, want me to get it started? I'll get yeah. it started. Yeah. 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 Well, obviously, this is not me. <laughs> That's a late menace. Her character in Seinfeld, and this is the dance of uh, the dance that she did in the episode called "Little Little Kicks." In researching the best ways to make friends, I believe that Dale Carnegie was onto something. One pastor wrote about reading the books that Dale uh, published. The Book of Proverbs 
uh, is all about how we can win friends, avoid conflict, and even impress kings. Wisdom literature was the how to win friends and influence people of ancient times. Absolutely, the book of Proverbs is actually filled with all kinds of relationship advice, and namely about friends. Dale Carnegie's book is about giving and putting others before ourselves. This is the main thing in his book. When we practice biblical principles that can attract people to us, it's not only attractive to people that people are attracted to us. That's that's kind of what he wrote the book for. But those who believe like us, those who like who vote like us and go to churches that fit us, those are usually the only people we attract. But it, it's also it's also attractive to people who are searching and hurting. It's it's attractive to people that don't know us very well at all. And maybe they're even lonely. That's really the function of making new friends is that you're, you're bound to run into people that are very much like you and you're, you're going to run into people that are not like you at all. There was a trend in Christianity that actually believed this, that the, the godly will not and should not win friends and influence people. And here's the reason. The thinking was that the gospel is supposed to make enemies. That was, that was what was going on. Man, I'm sure glad Jesus didn't tweet that in his day. In other words, there are believers that are convinced that we should give people one shot at truth presented in super subtle, confrontational, or even argumentative ways. It doesn't matter how it's presented. Once that one shot gospel presentation is made, if they reject those methods, then they are rejecting Christ and we can put them down as destined to go to hell. That is, that was a a common belief among believers. I just absolutely disagree with it. And I think it's a horrible way uh, to both be friends and it's a horrible way to think about discipling others. I just, I just think it's a horrible way to be a witness. I remember the Apostle Paul's challenge to the churches in Rome. And Paul said this, he said, don't, don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you, he says? Can't you see that his kindness intended to turn you from your sin? So take this cue from uh, Paul in Romans 2.4, that God is using love and kindness to actually be attractive to people that are hurting or they are just doing really, really poorly. When we make friends, we are going about our business, living life, but we are doing likewise. We are being uh, somewhat attractive to people in the way that we go about making these friendships. All right, so making friendships, the good ones, the lifelong ones, it takes curiosity for adventure and risk, but it is so worth it. These are six verses to give us some help in making and keeping friends. I said, some of them are, most of them are out of Proverbs, but there's other ones as well. Number one, become genuinely interested in other people. The Apostle Paul wrote to the churches in Philippi, don't be selfish, don't try to impress others, be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. That's out of Philippians 2, 3 through 5. Now, you might ask the question, well, isn't Paul talking to the church? Absolutely. Isn't Paul talking about the believers and how they behave towards one another, believers? Absolutely as well. But is there anything wrong with taking that same principle and looking at people that do not believe in God, do not know God, and begin to treating them with respect and literally saying, hey, I am interested in the things that you are interested in, starting and having conversations, maybe even a friendship. Another verse, do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to help them. If you can help your neighbor now, don't say, come back tomorrow and then I'll help you. This is right out of Proverbs 3, 27 and 28. This is one of those skills that needs to be practiced because it can't be faked. We can't just be t- pretend to be interested just to get something out of it. That means even like the only reason we're interested in them is because we want them I get it. We want them to commit their life to Jesus Christ. We want them to make their destination heaven. I get that. But when people sense that we are only doing that to get something out of them, I think it's disingenuous and I I think it's dishonest. Asking these genuine questions out of curiosity helps tremendously. The interest about others. Number two, smile. (laughs) A cheerful heart is good medicine. But a broken spirit saps a person's strength. 
out of Proverbs 17.22. A cheerful heart, this is another one, a cheerful heart brings a smile to your face. A sad heart makes it hard to get through the day. Proverbs 15.13 says that. Again, Carnegie writes this. Incredible. A smile says, I like you. You make me happy. I am glad to see you. People that see, oh, I'll just finish the quote. <laughs> That's why a baby smile can light up a room. People can see a smile before you ever even approach them. They, it's not just your face that smiles. I think your whole body can smile with intention that you're actually interested in them and you actually want to know about them. You actually want to talk to them. Mark Batterson, a pastor in Washington, D.C., he writes this. Some say it takes 22 facial muscles to smile while it takes 37 facial muscles to frown. You've heard this, right? Save yourself some energy, he says, and smile. Smiling relieves stress, it boosts immune system, it reduces blood pressure and helps you live longer. But wait, he says, there's more. Smiling helps you stay positive and project confidence. Again, this is out of his book that Mark wrote, Please, Sorry, Thanks. I want to let you know also, he quoted in the same book, and I put the quote actually in my notes, on average, a woman smiles 62 times a day. Men smile only eight times a day. <laughs> wow, we are, <laughs> oh, I think the women are just far outpacing us when it comes to smiling. All right, number three, remember these are all in actually making a friend. Number three, remember that a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language. God specifically told Israel he knew them by name. He says, but, but now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you, says, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. That's out of Isaiah 43, 1. God often called people by name and even changed their name when they became or would become something totally new, a new person. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him, which was Jesus in, uh, coming in the Old Testament. From now on, you'll be called Israel, because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Genesis thirty-two twenty-eight. Jacob means heel or deceiver, because he came out, he, you know, grasping the heel. And Israel means God fights. God changes names. Uh, in the New Testament, then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. First, or in John 1.42. Simon, by the way, means listen or hearing, but Peter means rock. So there's a good example. Using names and using that name is an incredible thing when you're introducing yourself or meeting a new friend. Not just knowing the name, but memorizing that name if you can and using it again to when you greet them or see them again. Number four, be a good listener. Encourage others to talk about themselves. Proverbs has got some interesting things. It says, fools care nothing for thoughtful discourse. All they do is run off at the mouth. I'll talk about this in just a second. Fools care nothing about a thoughtful discourse. And when you are just not thoughtful, actually, you are kind of presenting yourself as a fool, thoughtful means engaging in other people, too. And then another one, even dunces who keep quiet are thought to be wise. As long as they keep their mouths shut, they're smart. Proverbs 17, 28. Okay. James has got something in the New Testament here. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. James 1, 19. This is really similar number number one in the list of how to make friends. It's, it's a learned skill. That needs to be practiced. If, if I was doing a seminar on this, I would have you practice with someone right now. I, you know, I can't do that. I'm on, I'm on camera. You're listening to wherever you're listening to audio, listening to video, watching this happen, right? But I can suggest to you to try this out sometime. Try this out today. Try this out this week. You need to practice these kinds of things to get good at it. You need to spend a little time, even though it may feel silly, but physically practicing this gives us hope and we get to hear ourselves trying it out. You might ask questions like this. Well, what, you know, what is you, what, how are you doing today? What's going on? You can start with the weather. That People do that all the time. Uh, I'm in Southern California and so I've been complaining that it's been overcast probably since November. We've had a lot of rain. But the weather is actually a good thing to talk about when California has weather, right? And then listen. So not just talking about that, but then listening when they respond back. 
It's even more effective if you repeat a couple of key things that interested you in the discussion with another person. So they may answer something about the weather themselves. They may answer where they're from. They may talk about snow. They may talk about rain, like where maybe they came from has got a lot of rain. All those things, they're giving you pieces of information about themselves. And you can then ask about that. What's it like to live? In, in uh, you know in the northern states the Pacific Northwest I tease people well I shouldn't but I tease people about them wearing a vest the vest is an invention that came out of the Pacific Northwest because they're going in and out of cold weather all the time and basically their body can't figure out what's going on so they have these vests and it's amazing so I talk about vest just talking about things that people are interested in and you could also you know throw in a smile while you're doing this from you know from the other one that we talked about number five Talk in terms of the other person's interest. Now this, was, we touched on it a little bit. Let me, let me give it to you this out of Proverbs 22, 11. God loves the pure-hearted and well-spoken. Good leaders also delight in their friendship. In other words, leaders understand this innately when they are finding out the interest of other people. That's one great reason to lead and when people want to follow, there is an enormous amount of trust. One quote, I don't remember where I got it from, but change happens at the pace of trust. All right. And when you are leaning into and finding out about others, others' interests, you are actually building trust. It cannot be overstated. A great friendship is more about other focus than it is self focus. This becomes really difficult if you are struggling or if you are having a hard time in making and keeping friends. But it is absolutely true. Great friendships are more about the other person. So many of us get in these friendships where the other person does nothing but talk about themselves and doesn't even leave a moment to ask how you're doing or what is happening in your own life. Of course, obviously, there are times when it's necessary to just be that kind of friend and to only hear a one-way communication. Just don't pretend it's conversation. It's not. You're just a friend that needs to be there to listen. I was going to throw this in here, but Book of Job is really good at this. The so friends came and they sat with him. You know, there wasn't really any conversation. They just sat. They listened. They listened to a story. That was being great friends at that point. Be the friend that is interested in them, but remember this. A friendship that never asks about you is not really a friendship. It's just free therapy for someone. Lopsided friendships are difficult to maintain and invest in for the long haul. Call it something else. Call it ministry. Call it just a, a helpful hand, a heart, heart that goes out. Call it compassion, whatever you want. But it's not real friendship unless it's reciprocated, unless you are giving and you're also receiving uh, someone that is interested in you. Number six, last one here, make the other person feel important and do it sincerely. Proverbs eleven twelve. it is foolish to belittle one's neighbor. A sensible person keeps quiet. <laughs> this is great. Proverbs eleven twelve 12 say, look, read the room, folks. You can't make friends by being mean to people. Proverbs is saying it's, it's actually better to be quiet than be mean to people and expect that they will, that will build some kind of great friendship. Many will say that they are loyal friends, but who can find one that is truly reliable? Proverbs 20, verse 6. Many will say there are loyal friends, but who can find just one that's truly reliable? Dale Carnegie figured out that this, this one thing that is the most significant and deeply desired need in each of our lives, we ache to be seen, known, loved, and have significance to the meaning of our life. Not life in general, but our life. Like, who, who am I? Where do I fit in? Do I matter to anyone? These are questions that every human being has going on in their head and their heart. The friendships that folks are looking for and want to invest into are the ones that become mutual, not just in conversation, not just friendly banter. Obviously, those are starting points. So talking about sports teams, hello, I'm just far out of my league on that one, or talking about favorite foods, it's fantastic for light conversation, but it is not great to develop deeper friendships. Great friendships, deeper friendships are seen and affirming strengths gifts, 
and potential in one another. We've talked about this before, but being critical and constantly pointing out flaws, mistakes, or even quirks can get exhausting when somebody is on the receiving end of that. Last week, I quoted the verse about the wounds of a friend, but I can tell you this, it is much more effective and enriching to speak positive truths and pull out godly characteristics than it is always to be blind spotting their things that they don't see. It's, it's way, way better. Now, I'm going to quote a business review, Harvard Business Review, because there's some excellent statistics and studies on this. And you tell me, uh, I, I think it really bears the, you know, the truth in this, okay? Updated statistics about positive versus negative feedback. Now, you've heard this before. What's the difference between positive versus negative feedback? The average ratio for the highest performing teams, again, this is out of a business uh, article, the average ratio for the highest performing teams was 5.6 positive comments for every one negative one. Okay, that's like nearly six to one. The, the, co the positive comments far outweigh the effectiveness, the long-term effectiveness on performing teams. Further, only positive feedback can motivate people to continue to do what they are doing well and do it with more vigor, determination, and creativity. There's something about positivity and seeing that and pulling it out of others that, go, that wants us to go up, it draws us up to be better instead of figuring out how to fix so many things that we're not good at or fix things that are wrong with us. I just want to let you know, in making friends, these are tips that are not just helpful in learning how to make friends, but it's also helpful in how to be a great friend as well. Every one of these six points gives us insight on how to be a great friend. Why, why am I focusing on making friends and being friends? For one, I believe it is biblical and beneficial. It is biblical because I believe that relationships are, are holy to God because we have a vertical relationship with God and that's all about our relationship with Him. And I say it a ton of times, we also have a horizontal. We get to practice love. We get to practice holiness with each other. And God says, you love me, love me, you will love one another. So I think it's biblical and I think it's beneficial. I don't think we should do life alone. I think that if we had more or better quality friends, we would have lots of issues that we would be much more uh, easily solved. I think, uh, I think we would be less depressed. I think we would be far less lonely. Maybe even we would be able to handle or not have at all addictions that will try to master our life. I think friends, deep friends, good friends will do this. But two, I believe it'll help us understand how to make disciples. Absolutely. Disciples aren't projects, they're people. Similarly, friends aren't projects, they are eternal investments. Friends are the only thing that's going to go with us to heaven when Jesus said to send on your riches on up ahead of you to heaven. Who do you think he's talking about? What do you think he's talking about? When gold beads nothing because the streets are lined with it, you've heard all that. The, 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 the diamonds and the, and the rubies and all of the things made out of these precious gems. And we're like, but the walls are made of what goes to heaven? Human beings. And in that we find investment into friends. Well, I just want to close with this. I had my own kind of blind date experience and gained a best friend out of it. It is, uh, it is a funny story, so I thought I'd tell it. Early summer 1994, way back. Robin was going to be going to kids kids summer camp. Uh, she was a camp speaker back then. Her dad was the Christian education director for then our Southern California district office. Now it's called SoCal Network. Anyways, she and our three children would be gone for an entire week, and I would be home alone, bereft of food or social plans. I you know I didn't know what I was going to be doing, uh, and it would be kind of a week of sort of being a bachelor again. You know the whole thing like what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to eat? What you know what. All this. So she was concerned. She didn't want me sulking around the whole week. So she encouraged me to connect with friends, specifically friends outside our own church. Now, I had for church friends. I still have church friends. Uh, but it, I think it's good. I think there are good uh, things involved with, to venture outside of our normal friend group for a different perspective on things. Uh, and so that's really what came about. And she had a recommendation. My wife had a recommendation. 
uh, it felt very clunky to have my wife recommend. So she said, hey, uh, why don't you talk with the husband of a good friend that and we had, I had, we both met this couple's at this couple's wedding. So we went to the wedding. We we knew the wife was stellar, woman full of full of God, adventurous, smart. She was amazing. And and then the guy she married would have to I thought maybe he would have to be a great guy for her to marry him. And Robin said, You need to call her up and just see maybe maybe if he would do something with you this week, right? Do just do go do something. Like, okay. So before Robin and the kids took off for camp, I actually called my friend, the 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 gal and uh, I asked about getting together with her husband. And I was trying my best. I, I just thought it would make it less weird rather than calling the guy up out of nowhere and seeing if he would like to get together. Uh, that felt kind of strange to me. So she talked with her husband and he actually agreed that we could grab a bite to eat sometime. Uh, and he said, but if, if we would do this, we would go to his favorite restaurant, right? And, uh, and we said, well, where's that? Uh, she said, well, it's Claim Jumpers, in, uh, a Claim Jumper in Long Beach. Well, wow, Claim Jumper, it's also a favorite of mine. And so a date was set, and we would meet there at Claim Jumper. I had to remember what the guy looked like from his wedding, but I wasn't sure he'd even recognize. So, we're, you know, I meet him there, you know, and I'm in the, at the, the front entrance of the, of the restaurant. And we greeted each other, and uh, they said, okay, well... You know, how do you want to be seated? And we said, oh, yeah, first available, definitely. We didn't want to wait around in the, in the kind of the, the lobby area of this restaurant. And so first available. Well, what happened is the first available happened to be in the bar area at Claim Jumpers. And Long Beach, you know, I don't know if it's still there today. I don't even know if the Claim Jumpers still exists. But uh, to make things even more awkward, here we are. We're two guys. We're seated in the bar area on a Friday night. And both of us recognized like this. This looks like a certain kind of situation, and all we could do was say it and all we and just laugh about it. So we got beyond that. We got beyond just laughing at it and going, okay, so we had, we had our food, we, we started talking. Here, here's what happened. We found out we had so much in common. We're really close in age. We had very similar experiences growing up, and we began to talk about Christian music, the Bible. We began to talk about faith. We began to talk about family. And eventually, we started talking about computers. And specifically, when it came to computers, I started talking about gaming. And he was like, gaming? Well, I don't even know what that is, you know? Uh, and he said he had a computer. He had a computer, and he's like, I don't know. I don't know if there's, you know, there's no games on it. And I said, well, okay. So he actually had a computer problem. And this is what I think is so funny. Uh, he had a computer that was giving him problems. So remember, this is 1994, so Microsoft Windows was still pretty wonky. I think it still is. That's all right. Hope he's not, hope, hope they're not listening. Anyways, so I go over to his house and I sit down for a few minutes, uh, right? I, I popped Windows into command mode, right? And I, I know how to do that. And so this DOS C prompt comes up. And from the DOS C prompt, I run a couple of direct DOS commands, uh, right? DOS stands for Disk Operating System. It's very, very old. Uh, it goes back and it actually competed. DOS actually tried to compete against this other language called CPM. And that goes way back, even into the 70s. So I run a couple direct DOS commands. I fix it up. I type exit and I got out of the seat and his computer was running fine. So what's he supposed to think? He thought I was some master programmer. He is so puzzled. He finds out I'm a pastor. He just cannot figure this out. It's like, what in the world? How do you know so much? Anyone with DOS skills back in those days, they used, you know, they were considered to be a computer whiz. So to him, I was a computer whiz. Our friendship took off, and we have been good friends ever since. It started with similar things that we had an interest. We talked about that for a very long time, years over those same things. Music, the Bible, faith, and family. Absolutely, we spent an enormous amount of time computer gaming. <laughs> Our wives let us play late into the night. I had headphones, he had headphones, but it could not prevent us from screaming into the microphone. We had, I mean, just to tell you what was going on, we had to do this over, uh, over phone lines. You know, that horrible sound. We used to, you know, dial up through AOL back in the day. We had to do this over phone lines to begin with. So, you know, I just tell you, it was really tricky to get gaming going back in that time. But we did it, and it was just a blast. But it grew to where he is one of my best friends. It all started with a date. 
set up by both of our wives. How crazy is that? So back in the day, I started thinking, you know, I needed help to figure out how to make a friend. And over the years, I had to figure out how can I be a good friend. It, it, it's been an incredible journey. The Bible, the Holy Spirit has helped me in amazing ways to do both make friends and be friends. I'm just giving you some, some advice. I'm just giving you what I have learned. Now, I know you can't raise your hand, but let's just make this a prayer request. If this is you and you want to ask God for some help, you would like to have good friends, you would like to have better friends, or maybe you would like to have new friends, then I want to pray for you right now. I also want to remind you, you may be watching this and you're listening to all this. And you know what? You, you truly are thinking, well, I don't know God like that. You can know God like that. You can know God. I want to say you can know God as a friend, but really knowing God is, is so much more. It's not quite like a friendship. It is knowing God because he created you and he wants the best for you. He wants you to let him in so that he can change your life. So if you'd like that, say yes to God right as we pray. Okay, I'm going to pray this right now. Father, we're having this moment with friends. These people that are listening, I don't know who's on the other end, but I can tell you that I love your word and I want to share what you've done in my life. And so I am praying for people right now that need friends. I'm praying for the lonely. I'm praying for the depressed I'm praying for those who are struggling with mental illness and things that are just keeping them down. And I pray, God, not only would you miraculously heal them right now, touching their mind, their body, their soul, their spirit, but I also ask, God, that you would help them in this whole area of making a friend. And there are some that want to be better friends. They want to be a good friend to those who are so kind to them. Help them also, God, to be a better friend, to begin to put the practice of the Word of God into reality by actually doing it. So they hear the Word, they have heard the Word through Proverbs, they've heard it through the Scriptures today. God, help them actually do it and get on with it. And I also pray for those, God, that say, I do not know God in that way. I pray they would say yes right now. Yes, God, come in change my life. I give you the controls over my life. Be my God, and I will follow you all the days of my life. I pray that as well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Hey, thanks for joining for a little while, hearing some uh, tips, hearing some advice on friendship, and uh, give me feedback, glenn at lifecenterchurch.com. It's in the notes. Thank you for being with us, and thanks for joining in the series on friendship. We'll see you later.